Hello there, internet. Are you working? Aha! I think I fixed it. I tried to stream earlier, but I didn't realize I had changed some key settings and made my, uh, needed to renew my key. There we go. How's everyone's quarantine going? So, I'm working on some comics today. Before I do that, though, I wanted to mention something. I just got something in the mail. I I have uh, merch at Society6. So if you go to Society6 and search Sal Good Sam, you will find my uh, t-shirts and art and prints and things that you can order there. And... I did a comic the other day. <clears throat> it's topical. I think I'm going to tweak the design. I'm actually going to go there shortly. Uh, and move the art a little further down the shirt. Because when I wear it, it's just a tad high. I want to drop it about two inches. But here is my new t-shirt. I got a red one because that seemed appropriate. Wash your hands. Social distancing. Burn it with fire. Wash your hands. <laughs> uh, it was silly. It makes a fun shirt, though. Um, yeah. I ordered one for myself. The Society Six shirts are pretty good. They are uh, they don't age super well. I mean, they, or they age pretty quickly. So it looks vintage within about a year or two. Um, at least if you machine wash it like I do. Probably if you hand wash them, they would last longer. Uh... It's pretty good. I actually got another one too. This is something that <clears throat> I did a couple of years ago and it's kind of got a sad story attached to it. So that's uh, a corner. It's a fictional depiction of a corner in Montreal. Roy and Saint Denis. So it took me a couple of decades to get a, an illustration rep it's an agent for illustration art. We don't call them agents, though, because there's also agencies in illustration, and that gets confusing. So we call them illustration reps. And it took me a couple of decades to find a good one. I don't know who signed me on. Um, and I had written three in the box with samples of my work before. Um, is it three in or ah? I can't remember if it's in or the or in a box. Um, Toronto-based agency. Uh, for illustrators and a bunch of my friends were with them I got uh, occasionally got notes back saying they liked my stuff but that they had work artists that did similar things already so that was a common refrain it was it's hard to uh, find a good rep and the excuse me um, about two years ago, I got a message on LinkedIn from Rob, who is, if I believe, if I remember correctly, the founding member, the founding agent rep uh, at Three in the Box, and on LinkedIn of all places. And he asked me if I was interested in a job. Uh, it was for murals for the Second Cup, which is a coffee chain here in Canada. And they were redesigning their aesthetics, and they wanted murals of the neighborhoods, the stores, the, the cafes were in. Um, <clears throat> but they wanted to see some example I didn't have architecture in my, my portfolio I went online they wanted to see how I would handle architecture so I drew this corner as a spec piece just to show my my take on this kind of subject um, so things are a little a little um, it's lost some of its fine detail which is just a byproduct of the way they make t-shirts but uh, it was already a sim fairly simple cartoony drawing and uh, sort of keep in mind with some samples they showed me of things that they'd done for other locations. Um, and on the strength of this I got uh, the job to do a big mural for an NDG, that's a neighborhood in Montreal, NDG coffee shop. Different image. This was always just spec and for me and I ended up making prints of it and it became one of my most popular prints. So sold lots of physical prints and I thought I'd make t-shirts of it. Um, sadly, a month ago, 
I just got news of this kind of last minute. So I knew about two months ago around the holidays. Apparently he'd been sick for a little longer, but hadn't mentioned it publicly to uh, people who weren't close to him. Um, but Rob, my, my new art rep who found me a number of jobs with his uh, other reps at the agency last year, um, got pancreatic cancer and died pretty quickly too, which is really unfortunate. I mean, feeling sorry for myself a little bit, but I also had able to get to hang out with him a couple of times and we really, we connected well. So he was a cool guy. Uh, I can't say that I got to know him super well, but I liked him and he gave me some great work opportunities and I was looking forward to working a lot more with him. I still, um, will be working with the agency, uh, as far as I know anyway, Andrew's taking over his portfolio as one of the other reps and I'll be hopefully continuing to see work from them. I got a couple of really interesting illustration jobs last year through them. It's really nice having a rep over having to hustle for yourself all the time, which is what I've done most of my 30 years as a freelancer. Um, so anyway, that's the story behind this image. You can get both over at Society6. Um, here, let me see. What's the URL? So Society6. Uh, 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 uh. Log it in. Um, does that, I don't know if that works. It does indeed. Okay. Um, cue my shop. Yeah, okay. So society6.com slash Sam. Go there. You can get t-shirts, bags, uh, blankets, towels, rugs, phone cases, murals, all sorts of crazy shit. Um, I actually got some of my art on uh, pencil bags. So I have a couple pencil bags with my illustrations on them, which is kind of fun. Um, I do pretty good work. So today I am going to get going on this page three of a story called Acknowledgements, which I'm doing for a, um, a comics anthology. There's another thing I should mention. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So if you go to pa uh, patreon.com slash salgood and look at the blog, you'll find posts about this. Uh, specifically like on the post to this art you can get a good look at the artwork and I mentioned there's a link there to the anthology I'm just going to the links now go to all use this so letters at letters at Montreal uh, it's an FBDM so festival of BD Montreal or, or MCAF Montreal comic art festival um, they put out a book uh, streets of Montreal last year which was a collection of Montreal themed comics and this year they were doing Letters of Montreal um, and there is a crowdfunder for it uh, if you look at the Patreon there's a link there to the crowdfunder you can get yourself a copy and uh, then I'm also working on this story here let's let's say hello to people hi everybody there I am um, so I'm doing this story along those the theme of Montreal and the title was Acknowledgements and it's basically talking about my experience. I did a story called Where the Wild Things Were right after I moved to Montreal that was kind of where I was at after a year or two here. This is kind of another four-pager. They were four, it was a four-pager as well. This is another four-pager kind of following up 20 years later almost. I've been in this, in this apartment for 18 and in Montreal for... 21 years, actually. Man. Uh, so, here. Just getting ahead of myself. So this is my thumb thumbnailing book. Um, I do all my comics thumbnailing in a book like this. So it's a, this one's a moleskin, but they're all dot grid. And I use, like, every two dots is an inch. And I can do my thumbnails. It's uh, from New York and Blues. And for this comic, it's more of a traditional comic aspect ratio. So you'll notice that when I did the thumbs, doo, 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 there we are. Um, they're taller, skinnier, depending on how you perceive that. Um, they were done in 
blue pencil initially and then went over that with a fine like a 0.1 pen pulling out details to some limited degree so they're not super detailed that's not the point but i did work out a lot of the, the major compositional elements this particular story doesn't have dialogue so i didn't uh try to word do word balloons it's going to have captions of short lines of poetry the uh, story is written as a poem i also designed it so the the Letters of Montreal is going to be a little more of a traditional aspect ratio comic book. Um, but my personal anthology, which I'm also going to run it in, which will come out later, is uh, square. It's uh, essentially, so it's 8 by 10 exactly. And so what I'm doing is when I draw it at this last stage, I'm doing a lot of extra bleed art in the wings. And that way I can make it feel like it, it owns the page nicely. Uh, and still have full bleeds when I print it in my own book, as well as looking good when it's in the anthology, which I initially designed it for. So I designed it for the anthology, the the Letters of Montreal anthology, but I'm also accommodating the design to look good in my preferred format. Um, it's be black and white, and I've done two pages so far, and we'll get to that. But so I took those little thumbnails and I blew them out, uh, blew them up in light blue. And then went over them in this case with a little bit of pen but mostly three colors of drop lead pencil i've got three of these um, so they're zebra del guards 0.7 pencils i've got red lead in this one blue i can tell it's blue because it's got the blue patch of tape and just regular graphite usually an, an hb um i think it's hb or or even slightly softer and I did that this way. The different colors at this stage is more about being able to see what I'm doing, like when I'm overlapping things here. I don't have to worry about erasing stuff. I can just go over it. But I work, when I'm doing the pencil cleanups, um, not pencil cleanups exactly, just the pencils, I work in whatever I feel like. So this one is a combination of brush pens and, and pigment pens, fine liners. A uh, little bit of red pencil work when I was figuring things out and then going in with ink and pulling out what I want. This one is ballpoint and black ballpoint and fine liners and ballpoint and looks like red pencil ballpoint. Uh, this one is ballpoint, red pencil, and some brush pen. So, you know, it's, it's kind of my pencils aren't usually pencils because I'm going to scan them and make blue lines like this. Um, so let's me work in just these mediums and white out. I really have a, a pigment pen. A lot of it was done with this particular big ballpoint pen, which I quite like. There's multicolored pens. They're red. Um, and so I'll scan that and blow them up some more. So here you can see uh, the scale. There we go. There's the pencil so like each one there's a dramatic change in scale of course from the first version to this but then even still enlarge a bit more and that gives me more room so i'm working on a, a sheet of 11 by 14 paper and uh a lot of this book is a one of the constraints to create the stylistic look that I want for the pages. A lot of it is being done with this. It's a platinum carbon black desk pen. It's a very cheap pen. It's like 15 bucks ish, something like that. Maybe, maybe 20 with tax or shipping or whatever. Um, and it's got a nice fine line. Uh, it uses platinum carbon black ink. And so that's something that I have, I buy by the bottle. So what I'll end up doing is just using a, a printing syringe to refill the cartridge, most likely. Although I have a couple of these cartridges, so I might use them up. But I'll, I'll save them and be able to use them as refills. And then um, it's, cool, it's a good pen. I've experimented with a couple. Uh, I didn't really like them, but I'm liking this. So I'm enjoying using, getting lots of mileage out of it. It gives a, the sketchy kind of look I want for this story. So here's page one of this story, the finished art. If you go to Patreon, I have the this finished art with the 
small fiddles and digital tones and enhancements that I'm going to do to it when I scan it in Photoshop. And so there you can see it's me and my desk that I'm now using as the, the header for my live feed uh, title card. That's an Iroquois false face mask. So I'm just thinking about uh, themes of Montreal. Montreal used to be a, a gathering place for First Nations before we came and colonized the place. And then this is page two I finished up yesterday. So arrived at ice storms. It's a, kind of a poetry tea ceremony, comic jams, me and the guys. These were all references to real people, but uh, I kind of cartoonized and gentrified it. Me being alone, me finding a uh, company, thinking about how long I've been here. That's Ange, it's my wife, the company I found. Us going up her stairs, dealing with some family grief, our cats, adopting more cats. I found, I found a, a stray uh, queen on our back. Uh, porch. It was actually downstairs neighbor's back porch, but I rescued them. Uh, I had a bunch of kittens. They were, it was during the student marches in, was that 10 years ago? So 2010, 2009, something like that. And uh, it was boiling hot and she was uh, starved looking and she wasn't cleaning her kittens and they all looked like they were in danger. So I brought them in, got in our air conditioning and fed them raised them, found them homes, and we kept one. A little black cat named Scooby. This guy, Dave, he sadly died this winter. Jaw cancer. Um, and was pretty broken up about that. He was her buddy for 14 years. Um, but Oscar's still around. He's my cat. And then we have Scooby, who's a lot bigger than that now. But, um, so yeah. It's a story about my life in Montreal. And now I'm working on page three. And it's basically mostly this pen, uh, some of this brush pen. So this is a Pilot um, Fine Pigment Brush. And uh, that means, so fine is just thinner than your typical uh, brush on these. It's about half the width, which makes holding finer lines a little easier. Although ultimately the fine point on any of these is if it's in good shape is equally fine. But this gives you a little more control on the thinner lines and I wanted to just stay away from being heavy handed here. But I'm actually using this for like spotting blacks and little enhancements to the line and stuff. Most of that is this thing and then a lot of it is graphite, either drop lead or, where's my pencil? It was just here. Oh, there it is. I'm some paper. Um, I need to sharpen it again, but this is a uh, 4B Stadler. So a soft pencil, which I have a desk side sharpener. This is Acto sharpener. There you go. I use the side of quite a bit to do a lot of the shading. So in here. And then there's lots of whiteout, copious amounts of whiteout. My, my comics and art students were shocked to notice how much shiny was, and they asked me what that was, and I said, oh, that's whiteout. So all that really super reflective stuff, it's a little hard to get the effect the way I've got things balanced, which is good. There we go. Can you see it? There we are. I found it. Magic line. So all that shiny stuff, I'm, I'm good at not making it build up. You don't want it to cake up and create a weird surface. So one of the things you'll see me doing when I'm working a lot is I'll, I'll, I'll do something and then tap it with my finger. And that creates, I don't want to wipe it away, but it flattens it. it my fingerprint leaves a little bit of a texture because usually because I tap it twice and that keeps it from being too smooth. So that's an issue when you go over it. Like in here is pencil, graphite all over whiteout, but it, it looks good enough and scanned you can't really tell once i finish fiddling with things um i also erase so i have a lot of giant honking needle eraser but this has uh it's probably i use this more than anything else i have a couple other white pens and i have lots of pro white which 
I crack out occasionally, but uh, usually that's like a last stage. And I think for the aesthetics of the story, I want it to look a little raw, so I won't be using it. Um, so mostly I just use the light out. So those are the tools on this story. It's one of the ways I, I can constrain and change the look of a story from book story to story. Um, it gives you guys a look at something. So I'm working on, this is going to go in that MCAF anthology, but it'll also be part of my own book, Mind Engine, which is a, a new personal anthology series that I'm doing. My albums. Here we go. <clears throat> that um, will replace a book I used to do called Revolver. And uh, I put that to rest finally. Long story, but I'm starting a new one, my Uh The first issue is going to be called Ignition Sequence, if you can see a theme there. And the plan was to launch it in May, but then the coronavirus happened. So <laughs> most of the festivals that I was going to launch it at are being canceled or postponed. And even if they weren't, I'm high risk, I'm diabetic, and I'm not particularly bad, but I just went on blood pressure medication. So I don't have hypertension yet, but I would think I, I would qualify as a call prehypertensive. So that's not great. Um, so I'm not being too paranoid about it, but I'm generally going to avoid any big public events and shaking anyone's hands. And I, I've been careful. I can walk around with a pair of gloves when I need to pick up and handle things and some sterilizing solution that I've made up. We, we have a little bit of, of um, like Purell stuff, but it didn't have a much. So we did have some 90 proof rubbing alcohol and... Uh, hopefully I can get some more soon before we run out. We still got about a quarter bottle left, but what I've been doing is mixing it with aloe vera stuff and making very intense hand rub cream um, in the little Purell container. So that uh, has been my improvised stuff, and then we zap everything with... Uh, I took some little squirt bottles like you use for watering plants. They're, they're mini water bottles, mini water bottles, and we put enough dish soap in them that when you squirt it, you don't get bubbles, but it feels slippery to the fingers. And that's everything like cans of food, bags, stuff like that. Everything gets a squirt down and thoroughly covered and wiped down before it comes in. When Ange brought me the mail, she the package was wet because she had sterilized the package. So we're just trying to be careful. Hope you are too. Um, wash your hands. Uh, I like to say not social. I don't like social distancing. Doesn't make sense. Spatial distancing, but um, uh, physical spacing is a term that a friend of mine used that I think is actually the best because it's an accurate description. Simple, simple UI design uh, uh, point. Don't use weird, hard to parse. You have to think out or it seems weird. We don't want to be socially distanced. In fact, it's interesting to note that people are reaching out and like trying to be more connected with each other right now, um, which is great. But as a longtime hermit, I find it amusing that it's when people are f forced to, when you could take it for granted, you don't call each other. <laughs> you don't stay in touch. But suddenly now you can't take it for granted. So everyone's like, oh my God, I have, to, I have to call the family. You do that. Call your mom. Um, and, but I'm, I've been a freelancer for 30 years, so I'm definitely concerned, but uh, it isn't getting me too stressed out. There's been a couple of anxious evenings trying to fall asleep, but mostly the day-to-day -day feels like my normal. I just sit here drawing all the time. So with that, let's get to drawing. Back when I first thought I was live streaming, I did some of the work on this page. Um, let's play with that colors a bit. It's a little desaturated. Color intensity and white balance. There we go. That looks a little more human. I have blood. Hey. Um, so I've cleaned up. The, what you're seeing here are printed blue lines. It's those pencils that I scanned and then turned everything an even black and white, gray, whatever. Got rid of all the color. Um, and then color overlay as a layer effect and picked a light nice blue uh, strong enough I can see clearly and I actually want for the originals I like the the show through of the tinting um, but I want it to be kind of on the cusp so it's easy to ignore and even if I want to I can use color replace when I scan the art to get rid of some of it and uh, um, 
I was going to say, I got sidetracked there. Uh, for each story in Mind Engines, I've got I'm um, using slightly different styles of art. Uh, not maybe as radical a change as I've had in the past, like Revolver One. There are people often comment on how different the styles of art for each story are, and I was really pushing and playing with things a lot there, so they're more diverse. Um, but in this case, I wanted a kind of a rough, sketchy look, similar to what I've been using on A Bastard's Tale, which is a memoir. So. The constraints I'm using is uh, a certain approach to process uh, for another book that's somewhat similar in some aspects of style. It, uh, Dream Life, I do five or six iterations of the pages. Uh, these, it's a little different now because I switched to digital, so it changes. There's not clear lines between the iterations. I'm not scanning and printing blues. I'm doing everything in Photoshop on that one now. Um, but for the book, book one, I did five passes on the pages, cleaning them up and refining them. This I'm only doing three. That's one style constraint. Uh, I'm simplifying the forms, leaving out certain details. I'm leaving a lot of sketchy thinking on the page stuff. Um, and then also, you know, sticking with mostly thin lines from this pen and selective enhancements from the brush. And I have to make decisions at this stage about things like here, technically the roof continues. And so how am I going to depict that? like the ghost of the roof line. It's a closet. We have like a cutaway of our apartment here. That's our, our apartment we saw on the previous page. And that's me and my desk and Angela coming home from her work at the theater. My wife works front of house at the Siegel Center and uh, NDG. Uh, this scene, I'm playing with the idea that I don't actually get out much, as I was just saying. And then my experience of Montreal is kind of living in a little island on this island. Shed out back. We've been having a bit of a issue with our downstairs neighbor, which I'm just thinking about now because I'm not going to go to his apartment, but that's the top of it he's a smoker which you know it's his fucking wife uh, but our old building is very permeable and it's been getting we've talked to our landlord a number of times about it it's getting really bad in terms of how much of it gets up into our apartment he's a chain smoker so it, it builds up and then our places are definitely not airtight so it bothers me a little bit, but it really bugs Ange because she's got a very sensitive sense of smell. Wakes her up at night. And uh, we've asked him to be like courteous and like smoke at your window or something. He does not respond well to that suggestion. Fuck that guy. What really gets me is like he's got a dog. And dogs, you're inhaling your secondhand smoke. You want to be a stupid nihilist and kill your own lung, that's one thing, but. 
What you doing making your dog breathe and stuff? We don't have a post there, we have a post here, that's right. That corner floats. I should go to the stream page, open up the chat in case any of you guys are actually there. Doot doot. Hello to you too. Hand and Kinkaskid. I don't know. Hi. What are you? I don't understand what that name is, but hello. I find it funny when people call me sir. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, let me just change that. There we go. Bring that back in the screen. Here, I should share the feed. looking I'm half wondering how's the sound should be good Sounds okay. A bit of background ambient noise. And not very much lag either, which is good. Oh, there you go, the stream. So a little bit. All right. So we don't need this. Don't need it, and it needs to get plugged in.
No worries. Read your English. Um, I did a little bit of both. So I think first it's important to note that I am the son of an artist. So this doesn't mean any special gift or talent, but what it does mean is that it was normalized. It was like just a thing that was going on around me as a kid. My mother supported me as a single parent uh, as a first an illustrator. And then she worked at a animation studio for decades. Uh, it was actually founded by friends of hers. Um, Clive Smith used to hang out with my mother and my father. And then so years later when she needed to get a job and freelance was just not cutting it, she did a bit of freelance illustration. She did some matte paintings for movies. Uh, she did some cartooning and some logo design, stuff like that. Uh, sign painting for a local uh, grocery store whatever she could get but in the end it was just it's difficult to do the freelance hostel and like have a kid so she uh, knew some of her friends and started an animation studio they'd done a whole bunch of tv shorts and they wanted to do a feature length movie so they were crewing up and uh, she got a job working on what became known as rock and rule which if you google it uh, you can find it on youtube now They've gone and posted it, and it's full. And so I grew up um, not just around my mother as an artist, but wandering around Nelvana Studios in the mostly the the eighties, um, but also some of the nineties. Uh, or actually, no, was it? Let me think now for a minute. Yeah, mostly the eighties, mostly the eighties. So uh, that meant that when I did go to an art school. A lot of the process was demystified for me. I, when so, I, I got to go to an enriched arts high school called Wexford CI, which was a long way from where I lived and involved getting um, getting on a bus for like forty minutes every day. Which you know there are definitely worse things to go through, but that was a bit of a pain in the arse. Um, and then uh, I would go there, and at first it was great. And I had a, a leg up. Everyone else was like learning the tools for the first time. They were learning how to use and what to use. And that part I'd seen done so many times. So I was more already jumping ahead to fine motor control and things like that. And anyway, any kind of little edge when you're first learning is very noticeable. So it feels like I, I was able to develop quite quickly. Uh, once I, I started taking the idea of drawing seriously and doing it regularly. And so in the two and a half years I was at Wexford, my work improved very fast. And I definitely benefited from some of the teachers, uh, Mr. Tavares and Mr. Marsh especially, I remember well. Uh, I did not ever really fit too well into the academic scene, though. So there was like a couple of teachers that I got along with well, but I found the the way things were taught in high, at the high school level to be redundant and repetitive. Uh, it wasn't that I was necessarily smarter, but I did not see the point of, for example, I like science, but I was annoyed in year two that we were basically doing the same things as year one just instead of looking at a diagram and a frog, we were going to cut one open, which I didn't really enjoy cutting one open, but I also thought to myself, why don't we just do this the first time? Why do we have to do this twice? Um, so I ended up getting a little bored in year two, and then in year three I was really bored, and I started just skipping classes. And, well, after a few months of that, I got kicked out. So I didn't think that was the end of the world. I grew up with counterculture uh, parents. My father was uh, not in the picture at this point, but he died. But he, he was an anarchist, social anarchist. And uh, so I didn't really, I wasn't predisposed to thinking particularly, um, not to thinking that institutional uh, schooling was necessarily the best way to do things. So I was open to the idea of just going my own way. I actually went back to an alternative school the next year as an experiment. It didn't stick. did not like it. 
So I left there halfway through the year. And from that point on, technically, I would say that I'm self-taught. Uh, the qualifier there being that you, you still have mentors and stuff. Being self-taught doesn't mean that you, you don't have teachers. It just means that I, I did it on my own time and own mo my own motivation. By the time I dropped out of high school, I'd already decided I was going to be a professional artist. And part of the reason I wasn't too worried about continuing on, I was looking at going to film school at Concordia in Montreal at the time. Um, and this was, I lived in Toronto back then. And uh, that was partially because I knew I was interested in comics and there wasn't comic courses to take. So I thought the next best thing would be film class. Plus I actually had a genuine interest in film. I'm a bit of a cinephile myself. So I was open to that possibly as well. I was aware already growing up around the arts and stuff that I was more interested in making comics because I got to work on my own without having to need money or direction from other people too much. But arguably there was definitely then, for sure, more money and opportunity in movies. <laughs> Not to mention, like, in my generation, comics were pretty a pretty sketchy business. I mean, they're sketchy in some senses always, but in terms of legitimacy and being taken seriously as a job. So I wasn't too I didn't care about that growing up counterculture, but I was aware that that also lent itself to being more difficult to making a living. Um, and it is. It's very difficult to actually make money making comics. It's, it's not hard these days to make comics. You can get published and learn online and do all sorts of stuff for free. The trick is turning it around and actually making anything uh, financially. I've had the pleasure of doing that. I've, I've paid the bills several years in a row. Uh, particularly in the 90s, I went through a five-year period of working um, regularly. I wouldn't say like full-time. It was still freelance. Everything was. But I did about 30 stories for Marvel and a few for DC. Uh, over the course of four, three or four years, probably about th three and a half. I have to sit down and actually do the math, but I'm not even sure about what months I started and stopped, so that would be hard to nail down exactly. Um, all to say, anyway, it was a modest income. For me, it was the most money I'd ever made. I was 22 to, or 21, 21 to 25. Um, and uh, to me, it seemed like a lot of money at the time. But in hindsight, it was just good money. Um, about four and a half grand for a month's work. Maybe Well, it depends on the exchange rate. So it was, I was making American money. We lived in Canada. And back then, it was actually more like six grand because the exchange rate was so good between Canadian and U.S. funds. So I would make about $6,000, but I was also working, you know, 10-hour days when I was on a book. The thing I liked about it is it was freelance, and I could pretty much come and go. I wasn't on staff, uh, which meant that I was able to do things like work about half the year. And I just live cheaply and spend the other half of the year doing um, mostly my own art. I didn't travel or something like that, although I thought a lot about it. But primarily I used the time that it bought me to explore my own work and do stuff like that. Uh, I did a little bit of adventuring later on, but pretty limited. I did go to Burning Man in 99 and traveled around the immediate area in the province of Ontario and, and visited Montreal a lot every time I have free time. I moved here later on, partially based on my experience of visiting. Um, and to get back to your question about classes, a lot of learning on the job. So when I worked in animation, I learned a lot of things on the job, including the first time I ever picked up a brush to ink was because I was doing background art for Sam and Max, uh, the animated TV series. And we had to do a brush for it. Use a brush for it. 
The Pentel Pocket Brush, in fact. Which is kind of what got me hooked. I mean, aside from the fact that it, you can get just such beautiful lines with a brush, uh, it was also... The thing that kind of turned me off brushes is all of the management, uh, having to refill, reload the brush, and manage the ink load. Um, just became... When I first explored it in high school, it was tedious and, and interrupted my flow. So I did not like that. like that line, that shape. There we go. When it comes to learning art these days, you guys have it good in that there is so much of this sort of stuff online. Um, there are some people streaming tutorials or you can just watch. Sometimes just watching people work is the best way to learn. So you just ask how how to draw bat lines more backgrounds more. Watch people draw backgrounds, do what they do. Um, don't avoid it. That would be the primary reason people have a hard time drawing backgrounds. That is a large subject, though. So, I mean, like, it's not like I can give you some sort of rote, do this thing. You're going to want to learn a little bit of architecture and landscape design and, and just drawing both man-made and natural landscapes and seeing how things work and how they, they look when they're in the, in the real world so that you can understand them. You want to understand a little architecture and engineering so that you understand how things are built. Uh, you want to understand a little bit of physics. You want to understand simple things like... Have you guys have noticed like there's a, a, a fad, of course, I'm sure you have noticed, that uh, everyone prescribes a great deal of meaning to the golden mean. So that's a, a rectangle that's derived from proportions that you get when you use the Fibonacci sequence. Um, the Fibonacci sequence is a pretty simple number sequence. So like 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. 3 and 5. And so on. Uh, if you take those in by area and do areas that get bigger on the same uh, by area on the same sequence um, and you block it you know block it out the right way you get this rectangle that's called the golden rectangle and then you subdivide it and you'll get the the golden mean grid and people use that in composition a lot and there are some folks that even prescribe to it or ascribe to it, ascribe to it, of uh, supernatural meaning and or like semi-spiritual nature stuff. Uh, you know, I, I use it and I think it is a good design uh, trick. But I don't buy into the supernatural stuff. The real part of the reason it's a great design trick is people have used it so long and it becomes something we're familiar with. And there's probably an argument for the idea that the golden ratio does occur in nature. Um, note that I'm not going to say all the time, because it doesn't always all the time. It's not 
the nature's not perfect, but it does reoccur. So one of the things in thinkings is because it's in nature, it's it feels natural to our eyes, so it's very comfortable and that's appealing. And okay, maybe sorta, but I think what's actually more is going on is that we use it all the time, and that it makes it very familiar and appealing. A lot of uh, how aesthetics works is that we are drawn towards you know balance and the right subtext for color use and all sorts of stuff but ultimately it's familiarity think about how pop songs work so they're mostly very similar but you know they make small changes and that's how they innovate from song to song um, art is similar uh, and when people have done art that really kind of pushes our comfort zone it can it's if it's successful sometimes it eventually gets accepted but it often takes a little while for people to kind of learn to see it and appreciate its nicer traits so same thing goes for illustration and design there are aesthetic tricks and i and 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 things that take a while to catch on because they have to become familiar to the eye um, the golden mean has at least a century or two of heavy usage so that works for it when people are trying to think about what's appealing to the eye the reality is the main thing is happening is that anytime you use any kind of structure or grid whatever to make a composition what you're doing is in, in introducing a uh, element of order to your composition a plan and that's all you really need to do to make stuff work and you can do it at different ways it, it needs to be not too busy so you can actually see the pattern it needs to be coherent but maybe not too coherent because when things are too ordered they feel kind of boring or even static but sometimes you want static it really depends on the goals of the piece there's there isn't a single right way um but things like the the rule of thirds which is another rectangle based idea although it's more flexible so like the golden mean rectangle one thing people get around wrong about it a lot is changing the aspect ratio making it wider or square but then dividing it up the same way with that narrower cross in the middle as opposed to the rule of thirds grid when you make it you get it's proportional there's no visible narrower cross in the middle it looks very similar to the rule of thirds grid but it's uh, uh the golden mean has a this tighter midsection that's can't that you you can't take the golden mean and just stick it on anything else and have it be very meaningful as an organization principle because it's not the golden mean anymore it's all about the frame golden mean is the frame and then how you subdivide the frame if you change the frame you're talking about something else and if it isn't proportionate to the golden mean mathematically well it's something else it doesn't mean it doesn't work um but though it's working isn't those magical proportions it's the fact that you're introducing order in the first place a plan and then when people use the same system a lot like the rule of thirds and the golden mean they become familiar to the eye and so that familiarity breeds comfort and we, we get used to seeing it and liking it like an old chair i would like sitting in even if it is a bit raggy feels good feels right and then that's when people usually start making up sort of magical thinking reasons for why it works because it's not really a rational thing but pe we like to rationalize so people come up with whole stories and so for example it's in nature well so the golden mean is built on the golden ratio which is the mathematical sequence there's other metallic ratios did you know that golden ratio is just one there's a silver and a bronze it's true i think there's a copper i can't remember all of them right now uh, the silver is interesting because the silver ratio looks like an anamorphic picture screen maybe a little wider but it's it's closer to the one you see used in uh, concept art a lot and it's funny because i see people taking the golden ratio grid that that narrower in the middle cross and stretching it and putting it over top of an anamorphic frame which is too wide for the golden ratio but it's almost exactly the silver ratio why aren't people using the silver ratio 
is it not nature? Well, actually, it does occur in nature. The math of the silver ratio will does occur in some natural situations. So it's just as natural. Why does it occur? Because we don't use it. It's not popularized. So it's not familiar to the eye. It's not familiar to the eye. We, it's not become part of our consciousness as a collective. Uh, we don't think of it. Can work very well for some situations. There's a whole school of thinking about composition called harmonic dynamics. And one of the things I liked about them, they got into some of the similar mystical stuff that I, I always roll my eyes at, but I did like the fact that they incorporated some of the other metallic ratios in there. The bag of tricks. I was like, okay, these guys might know what they're talking about when I found that. They still found that there was a lot of pseudoscience floating in there around there too but you know as long as you don't claim it cures cancer or something that's just between you and your your spirituality that's your business Keeping this all very sketchy because I don't want a, a really polished look for this story. I want it to be like something that was scrawled in a a personal notebook type feel. It's a good example of something I've talked about before in the past, uh, where it's important not to anytime you're finishing art at each stage you don't want to fall for the the mistake that many people make of basically tracing your roughs um, the idea is to be developing the work and building on it at each stage and if you just slavishly trace each one with a simpler line or something. That's not enough. It's, not, it's it doesn't even, won't even necessarily give you a nice cleanup of your rough. It'll probably kill the spontaneous aspects that you like about your rough. And then uh, flowers. Um, when you're tracing, you get very slow and overly careful. And that gives you what I consider to be a very dead line, feeling line as well. So it's really important. You're not tracing when you ink or clean up or refine, or if you're going from thumbnails to pencils. You're refining and rethinking and redrawing. Every time you're redrawing, you've got a, a baseline to guide your intention, but now you're doing a nicer version of the, of the drawing. And it means having to rethink everything just a bit. One thing to help you with drawing backgrounds there. Sorry, dude, I cannot figure out how to pronounce your name, by the way. If you feel like typing it phonetically in the chat, that would be like, how is that just a made up handle? Um, anyway, if you're trying to draw backgrounds, aside from not avoiding it, also don't leave it last. So when I did the thumbnails and the pencils, the backgrounds were in it. You know, probably one of the things you're getting at because it commonly comes up is perspective. How do you learn perspective? You learn it. <laughs> that seems like a circular statement, but it's true. I mean, people keep saying, how do I learn it? Well, there are classes and free tutorial videos. I even have a couple. If you're looking for an answer that's along the lines of, well, here's the secret shortcuts, you have to do it. Yeah, that doesn't exist. You gotta go, you have to learn it. You don't have to do it like 
a lot of people feel like it's going to be this incredibly tedious mathematical thing. It isn't. There is some mechanics to understand about how to do what you're doing and what you're trying to uh, trick the eye into seeing. Um, but linear perspective is only one piece of perspective. And then when you're actually working, you don't want to be sitting there treating it like geometry. That's not how it works, but it's good. Uh, for one thing, you need to understand that linear perspective is built for essentially a camera with one eye. Which may seem like a redundant statement, but you are not a camera with one eye. You have two eyes. So if you're trying to recreate uh, the sensation of perception, strict linear perspective doesn't tend to do it very well. It doesn't. It tends to feel kind of weird and awkward and clunky. It often looks distorted because people don't give enough room for their vanishing points, so it's, you're compressing space, basically. If you think about the vanishing points for a, a rectilinear object, so it's looking around for a box on my table I can use as an example. There's one. There. There we go. There's a box, right? So when this is sitting flat on the ground, if you draw a line along this edge out into the infinite distance, it eventually disappears over what we call the horizon line. The horizon line doesn't move, it's the ground at a distance. And any of these lines that are going this way, while they remain technically parallel as far away as they go from me, because they get smaller from my point of view, they appear to meet eventually. When it gets so small, I can't see the space between them anymore. And that is the vanishing point. And all four of these edges point to the same vanishing point from my point of view. But here's the catch. This eye, actually I should open it. There we go. This eye sees a slightly different vanishing point than this eye. If you have a camera, there's only one. But human vision, every vanishing point actually has a slightly juxtaposed juxtaposed, juxtaposed different point of view. And the main thing about that is that, you know, for one eye, I'm, I see it from this angle, and the other eye, I see it from this angle. And our brain does the math and gives us a clean image. But in order to capture that kind of fuzziness in practice in your art, you want to know the mechanics of linear perspective, practice it, do all the little exercises and stuff, figure it out, understand what you're doing, learn little shortcuts and how to use some really, really, really basic geometry to find the centers of spaces as they are at an angle from you and things like that. But then, when it comes time to work, lose your ruler. Lose all of the mechanics. I mean, on a subconscious level, they're there. But don't you don't want to do math to do your drawing. You want to draw what you think it should look like or what you see when you have a live subject. And of course, it's really good to practice this with live subjects. Um, so perceptual perceptual freehand perspective. And what I often end up finding myself doing, because it is sort of the nature of sight, is slightly curvilinear as well. So you can see it here. There's a bit of a bend in the roof lines. Very subtle. And I just basically use the movement of my, if, if you think about it, your elbow to your hand is a compass. And the arch it creates, I use that curve rather than a ruler. And it gives me a nice consistent line. There's a mechanic constraint there. And uh, I have to think about how I'm handling that. Go back to Street View. I'm using Street View at the front of our building to remember what things like our neighbor's building look like. Like they have different brick patterns over their windows. Like that. So. It's not important that I get, particularly for this comic, because it's supposed to be sketchy, but even for most of my cleaner stuff, it's not important that I get the perspective exactly right. In fact, sometimes what I want to do is intentionally warp it to create uh, an interesting feeling. So look at all Kim jong Ji's stuff. He uses almost exclusively freehand curvilinear perspective. He warps it as a rule. And that's not just him showing off. He's having fun. But he's also using it as a compositional tool to draw and push and pull your eye around the page and get different interesting effects. 
So there's an actual like design principle behind why he does things. And then when you kind of look at his work, there are interesting distortions that I'm pretty sure go back to the same thing I just talked about in that whether he's conscious of it or not, he's he's uh, trying to recreate the distortions that occur from the fact that we see a compound, bifocal, curvilinear view of the world. So, all to say, learn perspective, mainly to learn how to break and warp and tailor, distort, mess around all that perspective to suit your compositional goals. And then, you know, try to draw real spaces. If you're doing comics, uh, it involves many different drawings of the same spot. You don't have to have a background on every panel. Uh, you can have a lot of panels that don't have any background. So also learn when to use it and when you don't need it. Things can get overdrawn. Um, well, that's true in animation in most art forms. It, if you're just arbitrary about putting things in, it, it tends to look thoughtless. Not as good. And that's good enough for there. Um, and then do lots of still life study of plants and natural world. Learn how those patterns work, the patterns of growth and life. Simple things. If you've ever heard of texture cubes, it's a way of uh, practicing patterns. So one of the reasons you want to do, I've got a video about this. It's actually one of my most popular videos. Uh, I think hands down is a video I did ages ago. It's not particularly good because I just, you know, I didn't work out all the recording stuff and everything yet. Um, but I recorded it for my class, my art class, just to, as I have something on the website for when students didn't write down what their homework was. Um, of just pattern exercises derived from a few different places, mostly things that I was, I, I'd picked up learning to draw from other artists. So stuff I saw my mother doing. My, my mother's best friend went to drafting school, so I saw her doing stuff too. And at the animation studio, and I would ask questions and get little instructionals from some of the animators. I think I'm going to have just all of this fudge sort of fade out. So I'll just rough, rough in a few. Yeah, which I was this way. So because that never that never happens, so I'm not going to do that. Let's do something else. Just a little bit of a drop shadow. There we go. And uh, so you do pattern exercises, I was saying, for two reasons. First is when you want to go do something like some grass or whatever, it'll help you speed up your process later on if you've been practicing things like that. Because um, they'll just be there kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a, a macro button in your head of how to make that pattern. You have to figure it out for the first time. You'll just I can do that grass thing I do. You want to be careful about just ha being too, you know. Don't you want to learn more than one way to draw grass? But or a brick or whatever the things are have more than one. But on the whole, that's part of why you're practicing them is you're creating a vocabulary, a library of textures that you can fall back on, draw. And then the other thing you're doing 
is training your hand to get the fine control to do what I'm doing now. Put a line where you want it, how you want it, when you want it there. Control it, get the expression and feel you'd like. Right now I'm using deadlines. If I was uh, using a brush or wanted a more expressive line, I would be I would using feathered lines. And I've done a lot of feathering practice because feathering is a trickier skill. A deadline, you just put the pen on the paper and draw, pull it and lift it up. And it's like the same weight and emphasis the whole way. A feathered line starts and stops thinner. And that line control is something that will be invaluable to you as an artist over the years. But you got to practice it. And you can practice it doing drawings. Uh, and expect to do thousands of bad drawings before you get to ones you like that are good. But um, the reality is you will get better faster if you can focus on a particular task. So there's something, if you look it up, it's called deliberate practice. I don't particularly like that name, so I always, in my classes, I say deliberate focused practice because I feel like it, you know, it's good UI design, be explicit. So you pick a subject, line control, feathering. You give it about 15 minutes is what I often re recommend, a very intentional deliberate focus. So I often tell people to take a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, divide it up into eight cells. You can just fold it or actually draw lines on it. And in each cell, pick one pattern, cross hatching, feathering, whatever, and do nothing but that to fill that cell. The cell helps you uh, get in enough before you get bored, but also not have like forever to fill the page. Uh, if you do so much to the point where you, it feels like it's tedious, you're not getting benefit from that practice anymore. So you want to be fresh and engaged and focus and attention, attentive to what you're doing. Deliberate, focused practice. Then stop after your 15 minutes and look at what the results you got. How are they working? Are they not working? Don't judge it. Don't go, oh, this sucks. I suck. Oh, that's horrible. You're just beating yourself up. You're wasting your time. Hang on. So, I just got asked a question. Um, what was he? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, assess your work. Don't be critic. Don't criticize it. Be analytical about it. Was it successful? How is it successful? How is it not successful? What can I do to get the results that I was after more? Um, if you don't understand. Uh, those you don't have answers for those for yourself that's one of the things you have to go out and look at it like okay so what makes a line look like it's supposed to look when people are practicing this and how am I not getting there um, and that way you can analyze your work and usually you can usually your skills lag behind your knowledge part of the reason people get so hypercritical of themselves is that they they know in theory how to do better they just haven't figured out how to get their hands to make it happen so being patient with yourself and being a little dispassionate and analytical is how you accelerate your development of your skill. So use deliberate focus practice to pick one thing, drawing circles, making ellipses, line control, feathering, hatching, pattern work, the anatomy of the human skull, the head with meat on it, doing facial expressions, the body, the arm, the fingers, the hands. Focus on one topic, 15 minutes, practice it. An analysis. How did it not work? Then once you have done your, your parsing and hopefully you've been able to answer those questions, spend another 15 minutes trying to address the failings, the areas in which you fell short of your goals. See if you can improve. In all, you're talking two 15 minute chunks of drawing and a little bit of time anal analyzing. You should have about 40 minutes of, of practice right there. Uh, give yourself a 10 minute break. Make it 20 if you need to. Go take a stretch, have some coffee. Pick another thing, sit down, deliberate focus practice again. Um, if you only have an hour, then fine, just do it once. But that's how you 
you develop and refine that particular topic. So if you're trying to draw backgrounds, landscapes, perspective, and uh, architecture, trees. You know, here's a quick hack to how to draw convincing trees. I mentioned the Fibonacci sequence earlier. Generally speaking, trees follow a number of patterns. And I mentioned the Fibonacci sequence again because the branching patterns, the proportions often relate to it. You don't have to know that, but it's just, it's interesting. It's patterns is the main point because they change from tree to tree a little bit. There are um, a few key kinds. So first of all, there are trees that grow and then when they branch, this continues, but then something goes this way. And then this will continue again, but something goes this way. And over here, something goes this way. And this goes up and something goes this way and this way this way. So each time they break, there's a dominant line. So that gives you this and that. You can keep going. And that gives you very natural tr uh, branching pattern. And then there are trees that always go this way. Right? And so on. And then there are trees that actually kind of spiral. So a branch comes off this way, and 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 a branch comes off this way, comes off this way, and a branch comes off this way, and so on. Then there are trees that have threes. So they always have three springs. Basically, the main stalk keeps going, but you get one on each side. and so on. Bunching of leaves and the patterns of leaves are similar in that they follow simple patterns. So you practice these as patterns as an exercise. And then when you're in a park and you're drawing a tree, don't try to perfectly draw a photograph of the tree. You've got a camera on your phone. Use it for that if that's what you want. Um, but you can capture a very good impression, quickly even, if you take a minute to stop and look and note what the branching pattern of that tree is. And then approximate where you see branches and stuff, but you don't have to sweat getting it precisely accurate. What you have to do is emulate the patterns of the branching of the tree. If you were to hold it up side by side, you know, you could probably find out pretty quickly where you technically were incorrect, that it's not how the tree looks. But anyone looking at that drawing is gonna look and say, you did a very good drawing of that tree. It's relative. I mean, obviously, there are the details that will lend to whether it's good or not. But um, if you get the general feeling, the, the, the way that tree branches and everything down, to most un untrained eyes, it's going to look like a good drawing. And even to a trained eye, they're going to understand what you were doing. It's an approximation of that tree. Your, your readers, the people looking at your art, they're not generally looking for your mistakes. They're looking to play along. So you don't have to be perfect. You have to give them cues, information to get across the concept that you were after. And then let them fill in the blanks. Uh, if you've ever heard of a drawing technique called loss line, it relates to the same idea where um, sort of a way of playing with the impression of lighting and light in art. But also what you're doing is getting the reader's eye to finish some of the work, fill in the blanks. And that's always a good strategy, design-wise, because ultimately you're tapping their imagination to do some of your work. And in some ways, your readers are, are better artists than you. They're going to extrapolate and imagine more. And, and they'll think you did it, that you meant to do that, even though it was them. Well, I'm, I'm OK with that. Are you OK with that? OK, I think it's enough ink on that. I don't want to overwork these.
How long have you used this now? Anything. Well, it's over an hour. I'm rambling art and stuff. I'm going to get up and take a peek. Make some coffee. It's time for a break. Time for pause. So, uh, I'll probably start another feed in a little bit. Or maybe tomorrow. Be well. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Make art. <laughs>